I'm a director in the last, you know, six years, really, I've, I've been primarily focused on VR. I'd say like 80% of the projects I'm working on or have been working on the last six years have been VR focused. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, especially th this messy truth project that we're talking about today that you guys have seen, hopefully, um, has been one of my, you know, passion projects, like pretty much the main thing that I've been focused on in the last five years. Take it. Me? Uh, Jen Dennis, obviously it says that, uh, you know, I was the former head of uh, emerging, con uh, I mean, branded content and emerging technologies for Bidley Scott's company. That's where I met uh, Elijah. Um, I come from a long background in uh, advertising and some film, but uh, Elijah approached me about this uh, messy truth about five years ago, and it became my passion project as well. So. Uh, VR is something that I um, have worked in on and off for the last five years. I produced a piece for uh, The Martian, uh, which was an actual three 30 minute playable game where you get to be uh, saved from Mars, as well as a piece I did for Alien Covenant um, and some other endeavors in VR. We big, big fan. That's my story, Weasel, Anne. Uh -huh fondly known as Weasel, but you can call me Ann or Weasel. Choice is yours. I forgot uh, from people. Jen and I worked together years and years ago at a brand studio uh, in Hollywood and uh, became fast friends and uh, uh, partners in crime. And uh, I, I, my day job is uh, head of studio at a brand studio in Hollywood called Troika. Um, and my passion is not what I do every day in my day job, but um, working with my cohorts, uh, Elijah and Jen, in furthering uh, technology uh, in the area of empathy and how do we um, make that count. So um, uh, my background in technology is working with another partner on um, AR and VR projects. Uh, looking at ways to help uh, movie studios use technology for marketing purposes and uh, came out with a great uh, piece for um, the uh, launch of Transylvania 3 with uh, an AR experience for kids where you're dancing with characters and stuff. And it was the first time a studio had, had taken that leap. And, you know, it, it took a lot to get one of them to, to do this with us. So, um, what I would say to you is never say never and just keep pushing forward. Um, so anyway, we're working on this project together and we had the great fortune of meeting Erin and uh, are hoping to collaborate with her and hoping to launch you all into this great world of AR and VR and, and the metaverse. So thanks for letting us into your world. Fantastic. And I, I just wanna um, uh, let you know that uh, Dr. Lucy Atkinson who we've been talking with for research side has joined us today too. So um, just so you can finally put a, a, a face with a name, we're not just in the ether um, is kind of always fun, always fun. Um, so, uh, uh, wow, such amazing backgrounds. Um, I hope students, you're all super excited like I am. I'm kind of like being a fangirl right here and geeking out. Um, I love that uh, you all uh, that, you know, Jen and Ann, you guys have been about had a background in brand and advertising because majority of the students here are from the advertising PR school. And you can tell we've blown up that system <laughs> and just thinking about immersive and having immersive be part of that that advertising conversation. Um, so any any kind of suggestions on like, how do you see that field changing and you know what are some of the things you you pose to brands to get convince them to that this is the right direction i think would be interesting for these students to know well, I, I would start with the fact that mark zuckerberg just changed facebook to meta <laughs> and the fact oh, that don't even get me started <laughs> the oculus from you know lucky palmer and i would say you know, oh, the fact Lucky's that, so uh, mad. He's just like, there goes his legacy, not naming it Oculus anymore. But I know. Poor Lucky. Yeah. Well, I don't That's feel bad okay. for him. He's living on a beach someplace. <laughs> um, 
yeah. So, I mean, I think that uh, we've just barely scratched the surface of the actual branded possibilities in, in a metaverse. And uh, I think that, you know, just like, you know, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, and Annie will, will, will remember as well, like when we would try to explain to brands that they needed to put advertising on the internet. And they were just, didn't want to spend the money, didn't want to be involved. And the whole world word of you going, doing digital stuff meant you'd get, you know, $5,000 to do, you know, a bazillion uh, deliverables. And that world has completely flip-flopped. You know, most of what we do now is digital, very little for on air. And they now understand the value of long format and, uh, you know, webisodics and all those kind of things. And they're much more open to that. So I think we're still in that world of um, bringing them over that threshold of uh, trying to get more um, acclimated with the metaverse. But I think that the the opportunities are are right around the corner. But then again, I, I, Elijah and I swear we suffer from post-traumatic VR sy syndrome where we were six years ago on the top of the mountaintop screaming VR, VR, VR. And then it was like, oh. And now it's like, everybody's like VR. And we're like, well, we're just- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> slow down, slow down, slow down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as much as the hubris of uh, six years ago, five years ago, when, when VR was sort of reintroduced to the world, um, they, uh, the trough of despair has been uh, a little, little, little tough, but it feels very much like there's a, uh, we're climbing out of that now. And that's a natural occurrence with any new technology. People hype it, they think it's gonna be the next best thing. And then the reality is someplace in between and then people are disappointed. And so, you know, but I, I think that, you only need to look at the fact that, yeah, Zuckerberg named his company Meta and owns Oculus to now. I feel for you. I have a couple of projects I built way too early uh, in augmented reality that is sitting on the shelf for those glasses to not <laughs> to be released. Um, so, you know, yeah. always kind of like just keep, keep coming back to that shelf is what I tell the students, you know. Um, so describe your roles. Like, uh, there's three of you. You all worked on this project. Uh, kind of, what what was your roles in it, and how how did you guys come together? Do you, have you worked before? To, I guess you, Anne and Jen, you've worked together. But talk a little bit about the history and how what your roles are. I think Elijah can speak to that best since he's the the, the you know ground the zero. Glue? Son, so. <laughs> Out of the glue. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if I'd say that's the glue, but it, it, it definitely is um, a pa passion project is the key word for this one because it, it took, it took, takes all of our passion pushing this thing forward to get anything done. Um, uh, so yeah, this actually, this project started a week after Trump got elected. Uh, and Van and I, uh, Van Jones, uh, and I were working on another project and we got on the phone and we were like, we need to pivot and we need to just shift whatever we were focusing on. And we need to focus on trying to use this powerful technology that just seemed to have ripped the country apart. And we need to see if we can bring it back together. And so we didn't know what that looked like, but this was kind of the beginning of that process. process. And so it was using VR to actually put the viewer in someone else's shoes. And just, it was, it's something that had kind of been promised along the way that VR was the ultimate empathy machine. And everyone was saying that, but nobody's really doing anything in that regard. Um, and it was, you know, a month or so after that, that I was, I, I, I think it was actually when we first met Jen and, and I, and I, it was at, I think the Lumiere Awards. And I said, I, you know, I want to do this thing. I'm working with Van and da, da, da. And you said, that's amazing. I'm in, how can I help? And we started talking about this. And I said, I want to do hand tracking. And Jen said, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, you know, and this is a, you know, something you're going to all experience as you move along. This technology is changing so quickly. You know, when I did the Martian, we jokingly, and you've all heard this phrase before, felt like we were building the plane while we were trying to land it and so a lot of these things you just have the best hopes that you're going to be able to do and yeah i did lose faith in the hand tracking and i was wrong oh no 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 hold on everybody lost faith in the hand, <laughs> in the hand tracking it wasn't just jen there yeah, were, there no. were, the whole the whole production <laughs> company we were tracking. working with 
Yeah, everyone, everyone was trying to talk me out of the hand tracking, but I just felt like it was such an important thing because it just gives you that extra level of immersion. And I was, you know, reading all the different research that was coming out and it was just like, there's something else. And I had actually done an experience that wasn't, it was all CG, so it wasn't really like ours, but I could see the hands in it. It was even using the HTC controllers. And I just was like, this, this is it. There's another level that your mind just believes what you're seeing when you can see your hands and actually interact with the space around you. Um, so that... That was the impetus for that. But Jen was at the time working with Ridley and was just so busy and was like, I don't think I can produce this. You need to talk to Anne. And I remember where I was the first time I got on a call with Anne because I talked to so many different producers over the years we've been working on this project. And Anne was just like, I get this. I want to help. What can we do? How can we make this happen? And this is before we had anything. So, you know, you've heard, I don't know if you guys have heard the phrase zero to one, but that's a very important saying because it takes so much. It's easy to go one to two, two to three, but going from zero to one, that is the gap. That is the leap that if you guys can make that, you are so above and beyond. Like having something to show is so big. So that's when Jen, when Ann came on and, uh, you know, working with Jen and we, um, we we did the fundraising we did all of it and we we got our one episode and we made it happen i don't think you guys have seen that episode that's actually with winston duke from uh black panther actually, I, I think some of them did uh so you did. So we, Amazing. Did, we were a little we wanted to give the students choice just in case anyone uh was concerned or had a personal issue with, yeah uh, with chapter two so we gave them choice to watch one as well awesome <laughs> but that wasn't with the hand tracking was it that was just the 360 uh, video? No, because the, the last one you gave me was when you had the leap motion that oh. we mapped onto the Vibe Pro. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's how crazy this was. At the time, when we said hand tracking, there was no Quest. There, uh, the Oculus Quest did not exist. There wasn't a Quest 1. The idea of hand tracking was this little device called the Leap Motion, which was a repurposed device that used infrared sensors to be able to tell where your hands are to see what help you type. And so we repurposed that, and that's what we use for our original hand tracking. Now, six yeah, years we later, we created a three D yeah. printer holder in the lab, exactly. so yeah. we could yeah. hold hold it. <laughs> that that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. We we did the same thing. Um, that's how we even showed it at CPAC. Uh, but but you know now, look, you know all hand tracking is ubiquitous, and all the Oculuses, and that's like kind of a normal thing, or becoming more of a a normal thing. So we became a merry band of three. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Nice. And tell me a little bit about zero. I'd love to kind of unpack a little bit this zero to one, um, especially because, you know, I think these are the students that will produce and direct and get kind of the next wave of immersive off the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we have our first project coming out of the lab uh, as a finalist for AWE uh, this week for an Augie. And to tell the students who worked on it, it took 18 months. <laughs> They're like, why does it take so long? Why can't we do it? Can, can you just explain like the process it goes into? So they don't think I'm just like, you know, don't know what I'm talking about or, <laughs> or doing. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll just tell you one thing. We have, we're doing, we're doing this whole series. Right now we have half the cast of the Avengers on board and we still can't get funding. So yeah. <laughs> don't don't worry. This this stuff is crazy. It is. We've really got it. Is, it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's such it's such a new medium. And like you know, Ann was or, sorry, Jim was saying that it's like there was this kind of bubble and this false hope in 2015 and 2016 that like all this money was being poured into VR and everyone's like, now's the time, this is it. And then it didn't really happen because the technology wasn't quite there. So all these people that lost their money and were like, okay, no, never mind. So VR is over. And it's like, no, VR is not over. It just wasn't in the time frame you thought it was. So anyway, uh, that's that kind of led to, you know, with our, our whole issue. So it's, it's like, you know, yes, we have this amazing project. We have actually episodes and we have two of them created and you know, and we got more on the way. We have all these amazing actors attached and want to make more, but we still can't raise the money. So yes, don't even worry. Take as much time as it takes. But if you believe in this thing long enough to see this through, especially a VR project, this medium and this crazy space, you're, you're good. You're good. It means what you're working on is important. I'm also going to add, like, you know, that was the other piece of information that came out with that announcement was that Oculus is now going to be spending 10, is it billion dollars a year? Billion dollars. Yep. Yeah, they, I don't even know if they announced that, but that's that's what that's what we heard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're not going to change their name and then not throw any money towards it. So I do think, yeah. 
those purse coffers will be opening up a little bit in the very near future because if they're really good you know they, they put their toe in with the purchase of oculus and now they're kind of all in so you know where facebook goes people follow so yeah, yeah, and you are the future content yeah. creators. So it's all in your hands, no pressure. But this is your time. So yeah. I mean, we used to say that the 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 greatest VR director, sorry about this, Elijah, besides you. Um uh oh, I got this. junior high six years it's ago. True. So you guys are just about you know the perfect position to to take that over, you know? It's a it's you know, I think for people our age, like we're blown away by the technology and I think we all have great ideas, but there's a whole like backlog of history that we carry with us about how story making works and how, and you guys come in with, into it with fresh eyes and a fresh, you know. And no way. fear. Yeah, just, it's, it's gonna be amazing for us to watch. So, uh, you know, let us know what you got. Maybe you can pitch us. <laughs> Who's ready? <laughs> yeah, they're all ready. They just got to win that award first so that they can walk in with the with the medal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like it's it. helpful. So, um, uh, t tell us a little bit about the about the kind of uh, conceptualization of the story. Um, I, I know that you and Elijah and Van were working on the Messy Truth TV series, but what was the shift in? Um, did did your storytelling change? Like, what did you have to learn about the affordances of VR to uh, direct and write for this platform versus another? Uh, I, I didn't work on the TV series with Van. Um, I, oh. I was actually I was already directing VR stuff, and then and Van and I were working on something a VR separate product project, and that's when when uh, when Trump got elected. That's when we decided to do this. Um, but yeah, I mean that there is there is a you know it's it's a basically just expanding your perspective and that you know whatever you're shooting you realize that you're going to be seeing this in 360 degrees and this isn't just uh you know just you're not crafting a frame so much as you're like creating an entire experience yeah i think what it takes away is that whole like film language that we we were so used to like you know telling a story through like you know close up or a cutaway or a you know being able to edit around something or you know, the grandiosity of a shot, but you know, what happens if you're in that grand space, but it's not about that space, it's about what's going on here, right? You know, so there's a lot of that language that we're all still working on. I don't think that that nomenclature has really been created yet. And you guys are gonna help write that nomenclature and figure that out with us. Cause all of a sudden we're back to, you know, you know, when Shakespeare started, it was just a guy, a bunch of people on a stage and that was all there was. And we're back a little bit to that where the story doesn't move because of quick cuts and fast, you know, click of a gun, whatever. It has to be great storytelling. It has to be great and immersive storytelling. Right. Our, our experiences should sort of rock you in your shoes. We want you to feel what it is to stand in somebody else's shoes and really see through, their it through every cell in your body. It should it should make you smile. It should make you cry. It should make you just outraged. First and, person. And um, what that? did you guys think? This uh, you know everybody watched one of the chapters. Uh, feedback. Creators love to hear. We would love that. So t share, please share. Anybody? Come on. I can take it. Um, like it, say it. Um, I would say like the VR one that I saw um, with Brie Larson, that one was pretty terrifying, honestly. It was like very, very scary. Um, I think towards the beginning, I was like kind of confused like what was going on because I know it faded in and faded out. And so um, I like almost like turned it off because I was like, oh, is this glitching or something? Um, so maybe i think that like that onboarding process like for me was just kind of like a little like rocky but getting into it was definitely like really um good and like really terrifying you re really were like pulled into the scene like really well so i think that was like really great Asha, was it the uh was it because it was in uh you were in darkness yeah i was in darkness I don't know if that was just like my VR or something. No, I, it was part of the storyline, I believe. Okay. Correct? 
Yeah, that, that's right. But it's also good to know because with episode two specifically, we haven't really had a chance to show people. We shot this February 29th of 2020. So it was right before the world shut down and we haven't gotten to sh like take, we, we intended to like take this to college campuses and go to fraternities, especially with episode two. And so we haven't had the chance. So even like hearing you say that, that's great feedback because we haven't, we haven't had the chance to show people. You guys are some of the first people in the world to really have got to see it. That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I have to agree with Anshal. I actually had to watch it twice. And the first time I watched it, I thought it was a glitch too. Um, until I really paid attention to the sound. It's so interesting to think about how important sound is to a VR experience and that you have to kind of listen in closely, more closely than you usually do with, uh, with having a, it as a film. And you're talking about when your eyes kind of blink open? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And she says something like- um, Keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. Yeah, keep your eyes closed. So it'd be kind of interesting if it started with the screen and you go like this, you know, so that way you're closing your eyes or something, but you're, you at least know you're in the moment. Right. That's cool. Mm -hmm. How ironic is it that I've never seen it? Really? Oh my. <laughs> well, think about it. I haven't, you know, I've, I've seen you once now in, in the yeah. year and a half and usually it would that's be true. like, meet me at, you know, do you have a quest? Because I know the person who can email it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a quest and I guess I should have done that. I'm going to do that when, we, when we're done. I just, I guess I didn't even realize I could do that. I guess I should. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, this is good. Then you're getting feedback before you even right. see it. So it'll give I, you I, a was, I was there when I was shot and I'm obviously very aware of what the script is. So. What other feedback or thoughts did y'all have? Did anybody see the Winston Duke one? So I watched that one and then um, I want to ask the question like what influenced your decision to have like the audience like walk a lot alongside Winston Duke as opposed to like walk in Winston Duke's shoes? So I think what's interesting about what you saw is that you you like and unlike episode two, uh, you you only saw the three sixty video. Where if you yeah. watch episode two, the the way that episode one is intended to be shown and what it will be eventually once we get this thing finished, uh, is you will be actually in the kid's shoes. So you are oh, Winston. Okay. Yeah. So you look down, and you'll see your hands of his son. And, and you'll be in his body, in his son's body, and you'll go through the experience sitting in the car. That's why he's like turning and talking to you because mm -hmm. it's like you're in, in the son's body. But yeah, so that must have been confusing because if you're only watching the 360 version, you wouldn't have the full experience. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course, no, for sure. Yeah, I, we, we should definitely set up that one because I've been able to see both of them uh, in as I'm in the shoes. And I, I must say that being Winston Duke's son uh, was more powerful. And I here, here I think it's because um, I felt like in in this play in this placement that you put me positioned me, um, I felt like um, more attacked because of the dog and the cop and the father on the other side where with the um the boss uh i was more offended and you know i'm a ballsy bit sorry but like i was really playing with my hands and flipping this guy off you know like i thought oh that's super fun you know but um but i i i paid more attention to his eyes and where his eyes looked than when he touched underneath the table because you couldn't feel it Right, there will be haptics in the in the actual yeah. full setup. Yeah, and, and also oh. I think that's also that's the the way that the Winston Duke uh, one was written was was presented was we actually God bless Elijah found a real driver's seat that in the experience when we toured it to CPAC you actually sat in a car seat oh. and you know you could with, with the hand tracking you could actually feel like you were sitting we had a seat belt the whole thing. Um, you could feel the rumble of the car, I think, at one point to move the rumble packs yeah. on. Yes, the sub pack, yeah. yeah. All those haptics help really marry you to uh, a, a an experience. Like, Aaron, what you were saying about audio, that's 
100% one of the most important elements in VR whatsoever, spatial audio, but also those little haptic cues, like even, I mean, I, I think we at some point had talked, maybe I, I, it's in my mind, but about like, a, you know, they, they do aromas with it and it would be yeah. amazing in that coffee diner shop just to have the smell of coffee or the, you know, smell of something cooking. You know, there's all these ways that just settle your, even subconsciously in your mind, what that really feels like, the, the weight of that seat belt on your body where you just feel like, wow, you know, so we so we have a, a high fidelity haptics chair, a D box chair in the lab. Oh yeah, I know. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, be kind oh. of cool to put those two together. I I I would I when we do the research, will we be able to do the full experience with the chair and uh, and like the haptics underneath the table? I hope so. We, you'd be the first person to have that set up. We just haven't because uh, we haven't been able to show it, so we haven't focused energy on there on, yeah. on doing that. But we, we would love to set that up. We were actually talking with the, with the CEO of D-Box for the original episode to like do a partnership, but it just didn't work out. But yeah, th those those shares are perfect. Yeah, yeah, and actually, Michelle is. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Michelle's a, he and we've been working a lot. Lucy is doing another study with D-Box, um, so we could totally set that up. That's Tell awesome. him we all said bonjour. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> he'll remember this for sure. Yeah, he'll remember us. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. They're, I mean, they've got, you know, the problem with, uh, in my opinion, with D-Box is it really wasn't set for consumer yet. When we were talking to them, they were really smart to branch into theaters and to, because that was really where the money was. And it wasn't going to be, you know, we tried to get a D-Box chair for, I think actually we did get a D-Box chair for The Martian when we took that to, uh, to Sundance and when we took it to... Uh, um, uh, CSI, uh, CES rather, we, they, they let us take one of the D box chairs and it really made all the difference in the world, but just scaling wise, you just, it's so hard to move. It's very heavy. Like it, it's not really for prime time yet, but it will yeah, be. They, they started selling a gaming chair in, uh, 2020, uh, and they just partnered with Ubisoft and, uh, encoded Assassin's Creed, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> Um, that's but that's because awesome. I'm a gamer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so definitely, uh, definitely, uh, there's room and, and growth in that area for sure. And we already have some measurements and metrics with the haptics uh, that we could incorporate into that. Okay, we're oh, totally awesome. getting sidetracked. What other, what other um, comments or thoughts do students do you have? Anyone else want to share or ask questions? Um, I was going to say that. I really liked the narrative and like it made you feel really just small. I didn't like like the narrative, you know, but it made you feel small. Like he's looking down at you. You take away like the companionship with like Brie Larson's character leaving. Um, you kind of just like feel powerless because you can't do anything other than like flip off the guy. I did that too, Aaron. <laughs> right? Um, yes. Yeah. It's kind of. Like, I think, like, the fidelity of being able to see your hands definitely put me in the experience, but it also kind of took me out of it, in a sense, because the fidelity of, like, your hands is very different from, like, the real world. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that's just a limitation of technology, maybe. Um, but I was going to say the offboarding for me was a little, like, interesting, because it went dark, and I was really confused. I was like, oh, okay, like, do I exit out now? But then the credits started rolling. So it's very much like a a film, like a traditional film credits scene that I think maybe could be kind of reimagined somehow, or I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. Reimagining credits in a VR experience. I haven't really seen that happen, but what, what, what would you think, what would be a good way to reimagine credits in a three, in like a full 360 space melody? Um, I, I don't know. I was, you could have like how you have that cafe or that space there if you were able to move around and like go talk to like or see Brie Larson's character there and then like the credits are obviously next to your name of course I'm not sure how that would work with like the producers and like the actual artists and things like that but for the actors at least I don't know maybe something like that <laughs> yeah a nice way to actually kind of um like pull back the curtain 
you know, of the story world and like, maybe like it's a 360 curtain and all of a sudden you have a 360 video of all the makings of where the credits roll. You put like, just like we do in our Mies, you know, we've got our little names above us or something. <laughs> really personalize it. Could be kind of fun. I like the idea of reinventing credits and of that use of time that you have somebody still a captive audience and how do you best either further your endeavor or your storyline, like you said, behind the scenes, you've already broken a fourth wall, you broke the fifth and the sixth. So what, what do you do? So thanks, that's, that's an interesting um, problem to solve or thing to think about mm -hmm. like yeah. that. Andrea? Yeah, I just wanted to add on uh, to what Melody was talking about with the offboarding. I know this was uh, based off of a true experience. And so maybe incorporating that in the end and revealing, you know, that this is a serious issue that happens, you know, repeatedly in society. And maybe, you know, there's a person, a real person behind this story uh, would be also maybe a good idea for offboarding as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Oh, I was going to say. I was going to ask, how, Andre, how would you, would you, would you, would you think it would be better? Because I love that idea. And we thought about even doing that with, with the first episode specifically, because we have like testimony of the kid talking about his experience. But would you want to hear that with audio or would you want to just see like text, like this woman went through this, this is her experience? What, what, what do you think? Personally, the way I probably imagined it, uh, if it was on like for on Oculus, for example, maybe having some type of like, gallery where you have you know some text and then some pictures some interactive things where you can click on it and go even further into you know maybe extended resources if you know somebody who needs you know uh you know those resources and things like that it could be uh accessible from that gallery space mm. um, i think that would be cool and of course you know these are very uh, personal topics so i'd understand if the individual wouldn't want to be you know uh on display in a gallery or anything like that yeah. but i think definitely uh utilizing a space to have those resources would be really nice for offboarding mm -hmm. for, for sure that actually what your point you what you just said is exactly why we didn't end up doing it for episode one that when we talked with the dad and the son that it was based on the dad asked us not to involve his son because his son had been in therapy for what had happened um, but what, what you said is exactly right. And it's about finding this balance because we also, you know, we really, it's about creating a space for the offboarding where you can almost decompress because especially like if you're a, a guy seeing this experience that like had never even thought that this is even an option that they, just like the, these microaggressions could cause such you know, harm to someone that like you want to give them the space to sit with it. So like, I wouldn't want to bombard them with too much stuff, but I also do love the idea of like showing, you know, this is true, this is what happened. I don't think we could identify the women specifically in this story, but like here, cause it was all brought to us by a group called ROC United, which is the Women's Restaurant Workers Union. And it's like, we could, you know, here's the, for more information, visit this or something like that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Cool. I know okay. you just got hands up, but I just wanted to ask, because it's only, Benj Benjamin, you seem to be the only guy. Oh, Xavier. It's Xavier is uh, not on camera. Oh, it's not on camera. Sorry, I, I couldn't, yeah, that, that's true. But I, I was just wondering if he did <laughs> the, the Brie Lars. Did you do that experience, Ben? Yes, I did. It was very and, spooky. And, well, yeah, and I, <laughs> I feel like in some ways, you know, having grown up in a world where, you know, that happens all the time or you know it happened to me a lot when i was much younger obviously but that kind of being in that position how it felt as as a, as a guy in that position what was your takeaway yeah well um first i mean sexual assault also obviously happens to guys but i feel like it's it probably happens very differently most of the time so in that situation where you feel that power imbalance um and like especially actually the affordance of not being able to move in VR made me feel trapped. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very weird. I did, I did feel like, you know, I'm used to playing video games in VR. I felt like I wanted to get up and like move around, but I couldn't. So it kind of added to the, the fear of the situation. Interesting. That's good. Like, just curious. But yeah. But yeah, it was as a, 
as a guy, it was weird to be in that situation because that kind of, I feel like that kind of like, if it was a male on male sexual assault, it, it wouldn't really go down like that. So it was very, an empathetic experience. And I, and I think that there's a uniqueness to that experience for women in the sense that I know it probably happens for men, but not, you're right, it's probably a little different, but there's not just the sexual um, creepiness of it, but there's also just your livelihood. Mm -hmm. you know, like he's, you know, offering her better shifts. Like, you know, if she plays along, like there's this whole sort of, you know, misogynistic, uh, you know, it's not just, you know, it's, it's definitely perpetrated against women in that way, keeping them subservient. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the combination of the misogyny too is, is something that, I mean, I don't have to deal with. So, um, you know, but I've seen from the other, like, you know, I haven't seen it firsthand. So, yeah. Well, hopefully this is a, a little glimpse. <laughs> right, yeah. So I'm yeah, sorry. it was effective. I didn't mean to hop over because I know we got hands raised. Sorry. No worries. Um, Anna? Yeah, so I was just going to say, obviously, you guys have talked about how this could be possibly a triggering experience and how we already talked about the credit scene and how that could be reimagined. I just want to emphasize that I really do think there needs to be a space for that decompression because if someone is triggered by that and that all they get is a credit scene, I don't think that's a good way for them to be exited out of these different scenarios, whether they have been through it themselves or they know someone who's been through it or they've gone through therapy and thought they've worked through it and maybe they didn't. I just think there needs to be a different offboarding process just from that perspective solely. If someone gets triggered, there's a panic attack, something like that. You're, you're totally right, Anna. And when we I used to go be able to go show this in the world, uh, specifically with episode one, we had kind of booths set up. So somebody could go like have a place set aside. There'd be someone to talk to. There was even like a little like confessional thing. If you wanted to talk to a camera and like tell your feelings and stuff. Now, a lot of that CPAC footage of, I don't know if you've seen that, of the guys wearing like MAGA hats watching the first episode, like they, that all came because of having these like decompression booths set up. So I completely agree that's essential. And another thing though, to your point, it's like we, the episode two and all these episodes, they're not made to be viewed by the people that it's about. So if like, you're a woman that's experienced anything like this, you have no need to see this. This is for someone that it will maybe will never have this experience in their life, in their physical body. And they'll be given this opportunity in this three to five minute VR experience to get a glimpse into what it could be like. But if you are someone that lives this or even if the experience is once, you, you don't need to see this just with the one where you're Winston Duke's son. Like if that is actually your reality and you've been pulled over and like racially profiled by the police, you don't need to watch that. Like that's, that's not the audience. It is to create empathy for people that might never have the opportunity to see this experience. I think a great example of that, Elijah, is you know the very first time Van sat through the first experience, uh, you know, when he came out of the headset, uh, he was definitely shaken. And he actually said like, you know what? I need to compose myself. And he went into the men's room for like 10 minutes. Yeah. And when he came back out, he was just, you could clearly see that this resonated with him from when he was a young black boy in a car sometime in his life. I'm sure that something close to that has been experienced or his family's been through that. It's a much different thing. You know, I get what you're saying, Anna, about like after afterwards having that that resource. And I think to, to Elijah's point, you know, I think we're trying to do that. And, you know, remember that when we created these experiences, we were limited in what we had in terms of finances and the length of the spots. And, you know, so all this is time and money. But, you know, the, we're, we're never meant to put these experiences just out in the world for people to see. Like a lot of these were created to curate and to take places and to show people, you know, in schools and at police stations, at, uh, you know, kid centers, whatever we can do um, to have a conversation around it. It was never meant to say, sort of, hey, enjoy this on, on the Oculus Go, you know. Like, yeah, that, that's why we still haven't released it on the Oculus Store, because if, if we just dumped it on the store, to your point, and it's like, Anybody could just turn this on and be like, oh, Van Jones, I want to see this. And it's like, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, this is this is a whole thing here. This isn't just like, oh, have fun. Like, go go play Beat Saber and check out Messy Truth, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, not, not a good combo right there. No, 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 no. 
Um, what you're saying, though, I think is uh, really influential to Melody and Anshul, who have teamed up for their project this class, this semester. Um, they've been studying women in gaming and the whole Gamergate issue, and they're doing something similar, don't you think, Anshul and Melody, on where you're setting yours up? No, yeah, like it, I think we're um, basically gonna like. Should I? I don't know. Should I explain what we? Yeah, doing? I think I think it's interesting this conversation. Aren't you guys curious now? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um. Yeah. So. Um. So what we're doing and how we're addressing this issue, we're basically seeing how like the gaming world was kind of like built for men, um, essentially, and then how women interact with gaming now, and like basically like we did like a bunch of research. We interviewed. Uh, women from like all age groups or whatever and see what they get out from gaming what their motivations are to come back every day to play games and stuff and um essentially what we're trying to do now is just create like an experience um like a convention kind of thing where we invite companies who um or strive to like uh, have women representation in their um companies or whatever and then have them bring their games that are kind of like you know they have input from all sides, like, you know, from men and women. So that's like, you know, games built for everyone, not just men. And so, um, and then, so they have like little, little demos. It kind of creates a safe space for newbies to try out different games and stuff like that. Cause um, that was like another thing that like, it's so hard to like cross that barrier of like being a newbie to being good at a game. Cause the people in the gaming community itself do a great job of like making it as uninviting as possible because it'll be like you don't know this you need you need to know everything about everything and so what we're essentially doing is that at like the beginning of the um convention um we're basically like doing like a theater performance uh per se and it'll be like um a girl actor just like trying out a game or whatever everyone has to try out this like one kind of like um game that we're just going to kind of place there and then um like different male actors will just kind of like you know throw insults and hurl insults at them and see how everyone else kind of reacts to that and then it's kind of like um like what y'all are doing but just kind of like in real life and then everyone like get their genuine re reactions because it's like playing out in front of them they don't know that these are actors and then after that, we've kind of like set the scene of like, this is what women face. Um, how, how did people react to this? And then that's kind of like their onboarding experience to getting into the convention. Um, Melody, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, just to kind of like Aaron's point, I think the Messy, Messy Truth episodes was very much along the lines of what we wanted to do. So we're trying to create this experience or the solution to the problem of like basically blatant harassment towards women in the gaming community um and either emulate that in a vr simulation very much like the messy truth episodes or in like a live theater immersive like immersive live theater experience sort of so those are kind of the two situations or solutions we were torn between and i think we are going with the live theater but uh putting it in a vr space would definitely be interesting if we had like the time I guess and like the <laughs> resources sure, to do so to scale it. like I think that's what's interesting about this connection is you guys are both creating simulated real world experiences for people to reflect on what is already happening in our world and like how they're how Melody and Anshul are kind of connecting it to an entrance into a conference where you learn more imagine kind of the places you could situate this story it could be it could be actually in group therapy or it could be at in a, at like different events where women get together to have these or, or where people are learning it i guess kind of like how y'all did with with the last convention in chapter one um lucy you had a question i do and but i i don't want to take time from students so if if anyone else wants to say something okay i'm going to keep talking then so <laughs> so when i finished watching um the the second episode of the messy truth i felt like i needed a shower i was like i i need to wash this experience off me it felt very physical like i was in the moment which is the whole purpose right it's it's to put you in that moment and to really feel it 
Um, so I think it's very effective at that. I want to go back to the idea of how do you offboard people? Yeah. And this is where I put my, my researcher hat on. And because the experience is so immersive and so compelling, I think you run the risk of pulling people out of that if you say, okay, this happened to this one person. There's this theory in communication of framing episodic and thematic. And if you frame something, frame something episodically as a, as a one-off, then people tend to blame that person for what happened. Whereas if you blame, uh, frame something thematically as a much larger issue, then people tend to say, oh, we need policy change. We need laws to change to fix this. Um, and so it's an empirical question. It's something that research could, could explore. But I would hate for you guys to unintentionally kind of undo all that great empathy that, that's created by at the end saying, okay, you know, this was this one woman's experience. I, I, I would not want people to say, okay, well, then it's not going to happen to me because I'm not that person. Right. It's so that's my, my researcher hat. I, I'm I'm the Debbie Downer. I'm like, you can't do that. You you must test it first. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not you're not the Debbie Downer. It, it's uh the, the reality is is that we um you know, you know, I, I didn't I didn't hear what Andrea was saying so much as like we have to focus it on the specific individual. And I don't think that would well, first of all, it's not based on a specific the, the specific event it was based on was so much worse. Like we had to dial it down so so drastically to make it something that we felt like we could share people that without giving anyone PTSD. Um, so we wouldn't even want to correlate it to any individual, but it, I, I, what I resonated with was just the idea of like sharing, you know, resources for potentially like here, you know, if this is ROC United or something like that, but I completely agree that we can't make this about the individual. It's about the overall experience of like, this is a whole group, even just like, you know, there's well, a group of you know women that experience these microaggressions, but also just like women in the restaurant industry are two to three times more likely to experience this because they're based their work is based on tips. Yeah. Yeah. So I totally, I totally hear you, and, I, and it's not Debbie Downer at all. It's it's exactly right. Um, it, it, it's it's context dependent. What were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, do you think it needs just an epilogue at the end of some sort of a graphic treatment or a or a, a voiceover saying, you know, this happens to millions of women every day. Yeah, and well, Joy, Joy actually yeah. put in the chat, um, maybe some facts or figures, you know, yeah, to help ground it in kind of like the bigger conversation. Maybe somebody could give us some facts and figures. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, um, we're short on those. We're, we're, I, we're big on Hollywood, but we're not short on facts and figures. Um, but that, no, that's I, true. I, I also do want to say that I think I think it will be it'll be very informative once we actually are able to go show this to people, especially men that would never necessarily have the experience to see this. And like so that 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 I think will inform a lot of this because that that on that offboarding is is what we're really focused on. So like, you know, does that detract from it? If there is numbers and facts at the end of such an emotional thing, like we just want to be able to make sure that like that emotional impact, you should be left with that. What do you feel? Because all the numbers and all the stats and all the things that can come from TV. But what we're able to do is transcend that and go deeper and hit you right in the gut. And then it's like, okay, what do you feel? And did that actually change you? You know, I'm curious to follow up with these CPAC guys like years later and be like, so you had an emotional experience. You talked about it. Like you talked about being changed. Did it last? And I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, I that's kind of my biggest uh, question with empathy as well. And something my first study was, how long does empathy last with a VR experience, right? Um, and I, I must say that in the first study I did, and it was a pilot, so I'd be really curious to try it with this, it didn't last very long, you know? Um, and, and I believe it was because there wasn't offboarding, because it wasn't couched in kind of that educational or conversation piece, but instead people watched the VR experience and then they left and though we gave them a one pager with like, we called it the take action sheet, you know, share it with a friend, watch it again, watch another thing from the creator. So maybe like another chapter, you know, uh, make a donation to that cause, all those things. The most they did was talk, talk to someone about it. And I went, oh, on social, online, that's my, my first reaction <laughs> to share it online, only in person. And it might be also in person because of the volatile discussions that were had or like the, 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 right. the heavy subject matter, you know, yeah. that we were doing. Yeah. 
I wonder, I wonder though, if that's, you know, sometimes the experience is matched by the length of time you're in it. Yeah. You know, if you're almost in a car accident, like you're like freaked out, for that, but then you kind of move on. You're like, you forgot all about that. And, you know, we're still in the infancy of this technology and we're, you know, we're able to create these event, you know, these experiences, but for a lot of reasons, they're not very long. Like, you know, yeah, the experience is two to three minutes. And I, I think that's hard. It's, it's a good start, but it, it can't be the, the solve for everything. You know, I can point to, and I've talked to these guys about this, there's that, you know, reality, uh, not reality show, that sh show on Netflix called Made. And it's a 10, you know, hour series. And like, once you're hammered with that, like, I think time, more time in these experiences as time goes on yeah. will be more yeah. helpful to make a much more lasting impression. And as, as we progress, we can make these experiences longer, I think. And was the time different? So two things on that. Was the time different from chapter one and two? Because I felt like one was longer. Um, they're pretty close. I think it might one, uh, one of them might be three minutes, one might be four minutes, but okay. they're pretty close, yeah. Okay, and, I, I, and the second thing uh, is, I, I really believe that uh, haptics, like when you add the chair and the thing, that that type of um there is real research about um recall and memory cognition yeah. related to the more you Im immerse someone and immersing with haptics versus actually um a 360 or even six degrees of freedom space is very different yeah. um, so you could do a comparison of those to really kind of get to understanding that recall for sure and imagine when that dog comes in and you feel the breath yeah i mean yep. ouch that scared yeah. the pants off me i mean that's why we want everyone to learn like a lot of people are pushing us i had a meeting earlier today about like a virtual world for university of austin and i'm like i'm sorry but if you're trying to pitch me the same classroom that I see we're trying to get rid of, that I've been trying to get rid of the lecture hall here, and you put it in the big virtual reality world, uh, it's not flying. <laughs> it's like, because there's so much you could do with a space differently to, to learn. But like, if it was an exploratorium with like, uh, not with haptics or heat or sound, and I'm connected to people in the virtual world, but I feel like I can touch something, that's going to be a totally different learning experience. It's exciting. Uh, Melody, did you have your hand raised? Oh, I'm sorry, this is going to like back check a little bit, though. Um, to the point of offboarding, I was thinking how you're saying, like, you don't want it to just be singled out, like, oh, only one, like, one person has this experience. I think maybe if you had, like, facts being read aloud, so it's audio by like, different women, that might, like, Kind of open it up and get like the consumers thinking oh man this is this is happening and like a lot of people experience it and also maybe like have captions or like have the to be like accessible uh so like everyone can read it or like have the text on the screen while it's being voiced over that just might be an idea or interesting that's cool very cool yeah um, so I have another question in regards to creative choices. So, you know, um, it sounds like y'all did your research and you interviewed and talked to people like the chapter two, right? With the whole women in restaurant. Um, can you, can you kind of talk a little bit about the choices you made, what you, what you, uh, let go of and what you kept, what you really felt was the kind of crux of your story that you knew you needed to share? Cause I think a lot of these uh, um, explorers are having to make those choices right now as they design experiences after conducting a ton of research and data and sharing your process, I think would help. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think for ours, depending on what you guys are making, I think it will be more difficult, but for us, it was pretty straightforward. It was that we couldn't show anything that we actually felt would give someone more trauma than the empathy we would be potentially creating. So it's like being really aware that like, you know, in the actual story, there was a lot more, it wasn't just like a reach under the leg, you know, and, and like grab the leg. It was like a lot more inappropriate touching and a lot of, you know, just verbal harassment and just all of these things that we felt 
it was just it would just be too much maybe and um and, and for for some people to see and so it was it was just finding that that right balance that still gave you the energy and like you know lucy like you were saying just like the kind of just you wanted to go take a shower like that the smell of the guy was just there it was like it's creepy and gross and then you get the vibe and like there could even be that slight invasion of space if he just you know touches your leg and we do want to put the haptics you feel that little buzz but you know anything more than that it was like we're we're running the risk of you know creating actual trauma and that's not what this is about mm. thank you so much we really enjoyed the conversation um and i hope you got some 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 feedback uh for your piece uh you know you can always uh, knock on our door to try anything uh you you want to share with us